So, the different technologies which have been employed to study the systems biology. Obviously, you need high throughput data sets which could be derived from micro array platforms, RNA deep sequencing, different configurations of mass spectrometry, different type of structural proteomic tools and protein interaction data sets. So, some of the technologies which are commonly employed in systems biology can be classified broadly under the following techniques for genomics the high throughput DNA sequencing methodologies, mutation detection using SNP methods. For transcriptomics the transcript measurement can include serial analysis of gene expression SAGE, gene chips, microarrays and RNA sequencing. For proteomics mass spectrometry, two dimensional electrophoresis, protein chips, yeast to hybrids. X-ray NMR is mainly employed for the metabolic analysis, the metabolomics. So, as you can see here to generate the systems level information, the system study requires different type of technologies which could be employed in the biological systems at genome level by studying different type of technologies using high throughput sequencing, high density arrays, transcriptomics, different type of transcriptome analysis using RNA sequencing and microarrays, proteome we discussed many methodologies, metabolome could be either using NMR or mass spectrometry and then phenome which is studying about the images by using PET or NMR methods. So, each level of these omic technologies can be useful for studying the system biology. Let us now talk about how to model the biological networks. To build a model in system biology, first of all the parse list can be generated by using data sets derived from the systems biology approaches. The systems or subsystems model can be generated which can be used for the systems model analysis. Now, this could be applied for the real systems and by applying the knowledge using bioinformatics tools it could be again applied back to the original components which could be used to derive some hypothesis and validation of these data sets. So, it will work like a closed loop. To build the models in systems biology information is generated at different levels. Level 1 such as DNA and gene expression, level 2 the intracellular networks, level 3 cell cell and transmembrane signals and level 4 integrated organ level information. What are the frameworks required for the modeling schemes? Different type of deterministic or stochastic models have been proposed. The compartmental variables or individual or functional variables have been studied. The specially homogeneous or specially explicit models are generated which could be applied in the uniform time scale or separated time scales. Now, this framework could involve single scale entities or cross scale entities. As you can see here this framework requires different level of information in very complex manner whether it is curation of the databases, how to align these information using bioinformatic tools to generate the predictive models which could be also developed by using the literature curated data sets or experimental data sets and finally, it could be used to study the systems level properties. Let us discuss the workflow of mathematical modeling. A paradigm can be proposed based on modify, model, measure and mine. So, systematic experiments different type of molecular genetics, 
chemical genetics and cell engineering approaches can be used for modifying and different level of measurements by applying microarrays, spectroscopy imaging and microfluidics based approaches from proteomics and genomics can be used further for mining which involves bioinformatics, databases and data semantics. Now, these data sets could be used to derive the models which could be reaction, mechanistic, statistical or stochastic models. So, starting from systematic experiments to reaching and deriving the quantitative models, this workflow can be applied. The modeling of probabilistic processes involves, let us say you want to study a biological system. So, some experiments has to be performed, the experimental data sets will be generated from which some statistics can be applied which can be used for the comparison. Now, different type of models can be generated by using simulations and simulation data sets which can be used for intermediate statistics and by comparing these two type of information and adjusting the parameters one can study the systems and derive the probabilistic processes. So, what is ordinary differential equations and stoichiometric models? The quantitative analysis measures and aims to make models for precise kinetic parameters of a systems network component. It also uses the properties of network connectivity. The ODE is a mathematical relation that can be used for modeling the biological systems. The quantitative models mostly use ordinary differential equations or ODE to link the reactants and products concentration through the reactions reaction rate constants. To develop the computationally efficient and reliable models of the underlying G regulatory networks, these ODE models can be used. The stoichiometric model, it is modeling a biological network based on stoichiometric coefficients, reaction rates and metabolite concentrations. This is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarath Chandra Janga from Indiana University and Purdue University, Indianapolis. He is in the School of Informatics and School of Medicine. So, as we have been discussing about uh, need for studying proteomics and system biology, there is a lot of information available at the uh, transcription and translation level. And often there is not good correlation between RNA level and the protein level. So, today it will be interesting to talk about uh, systems approaches for studying biological networks from post transcriptional control towards the drug discovery. So, I have invited uh, Professor Sarath for having a discussion and a short talk on this topic. Thank you, Dr. Srivastava. It is my pleasure to be here uh, to talk about. Uh, some of the work that we have been doing and more generally the principles of uh, uh, regulation and how you can use systems approaches for understanding uh, biological uh, networks more generally. As, uh, as some of you might be familiar with, the use of uh, the concept of networks is increasingly becoming prominent in not just proteomics but also in genomics data and all kinds of high throughput data. Uh, so, today what we will be talking about is uh, some basic introduction to the application of networks in uh, biological systems and how it can be applied to understanding transcription regulation, post transcription regulation and as well as to the proteomics data and at large how this can be used to understand uh, the, uh, uh, the drug discovery, how, can, how it can be applied to the drug discovery concept. According to the central dogma of molecular biology, DNA gives rise to RNA through the process of transcription and this process is facilitated 
by the binding of the RNA polymerase as well as a number of other transcription factors which bind to the upstream regions of the DNA as you can see and control the expression. And RNA can give rise to protein through the process of translation and this is hap this happens through the uh, process of uh, translation with the help of the ribosomes. Now, in this process the proteins which are produced some of them can be classified as transcription factors which bind to the DNA and some others are classified as RNA binding proteins which can bind to the RNA and control the expression at the post transcription level as opposed to at the transcription level where transcription factors bind to the DNA. Now, as an example, let us see that case of RRC transcription factor in a bacterial uh, genome. Uh, such as E. coli. This particular transcription factor binds to the upstream regions of RABAD operon which encodes for the enzyme and the transporter responsible for the uptake of arabinose from the environment. Now, the transcription factor RRC not only binds to the upstream of RABAD, but it can also bind to itself and control the expression as you can see from the uh, small orange boxes which are shown as a representation for the binding sites. Now, what this suggests is transcription factor can auto regulate bind and regulate its own expression or it can also bind to other genes controlling their expression. There are also cases there are many cases actually where transcription fact multiple transcription factors bind to the upstream regions as you can see in the case in this case should represented with the orange box as well as the blue box blue circle where other transcription factors bind. Now, in addition to this binding of transcription factors as I mentioned earlier polymerase RNA polymerase also binds shown in with the uh, with the green green box a green circle uh, green oval box out there. So, that they can control the expression. Now, there are other examples are also shown in this figure with the Mellar regulator also doing something similar. Now, this is uh, what we just discussed is an idea of how regulation happens from a biological viewpoint. Now, an increasing thing increasing amount of literature now supports the idea of networks in biology. So, what exactly are networks? A networks simply represent are represented as nodes and links or edges. These nodes can be biological entities and the links or edges are actually the associations between the uh, between these entities. Now, there are a number of ways you can uh, talk about the nodes or the entities. So, one, form on, one common form of representation uh, are protein interaction networks where the proteins form the nodes and the physical interaction between these proteins forms the edge as you can see in this uh, in the figure below. The, you can have a representation of these networks in a, in a, in a fashion that is shown in this uh, figure below. Now, an alternate uh, kind of network which is also studied in the literature over the last uh, 10 years or so are metabolic networks. In metabolic networks the metabolites form the nodes and the conversion of one metabolite to the other forms the edge in this case. Now, as you can imagine the conversion of one metabolite to the other is actually facilitated by the enzyme. So, the particular protein enzyme converts a metabolite A to B. And when you look at on a global scale and when you are looking at the conversion of number of metabolites one to the other and sometimes one metabolite can give rise to more than one set of uh, metabolites such complex set of associations can be called as a metabolic network. Now, the third kind of uh, networks which I will be elaborating in more detail in the next slides are transcriptional networks. In transcriptional networks transcription factors form one set of nodes and the target genes form other set of nodes. So, as you can imagine what you are actually looking at in this case from a biological viewpoint is the interaction of the transcription factor with the DNA and controlling of the expression of the downstream genes. But in the context of networks what we are showing here what we are showing is the transcription factor and the target gene or operon whose expression is controlled. Again in this case you can see that the a, a protein A which is a transcription factor controls B, but it may or may not be that B is a transcription factor and it also controls A. So, that might be a case to case uh, case and uh, case to case uh, specific and it may or may not be having a reciprocal interaction. As we just discussed these networks are actually this the concept of network has been borrowed from physics and computer science where uh, often this this kind of networks are referred to as graphs. And graphs are objects which are a collection of nodes and entities. The nodes are representing the entities it could be this these entity these entities could be genes 
proteins, small molecules, cells, organs or at any level you can represent uh, these entities. And the interactions or associations between them are, are the links. Now, as I just mentioned, uh, there are different kinds of networks, the protein-protein interaction networks, metabolic networks, transcriptional networks. In the case of protein-protein uh, -protein interaction networks, what we are looking at often is no directionality in such interactions and these are called as undirected networks. However, there are also directed networks such as transcriptional networks or metabolic networks. In these cases, there is a flow of information i.e. where A controls B which should mean A is controlling, A is regulating B. So, therefore, there is a directionality and these are uh, often commonly studied as regulatory networks and uh, we will be talking in more detail in the next slides. However, before we get into the more specific observations about the uh, properties of these networks, one uh, set of common properties which are studied when you are looking at biological networks are uh, degree, path length and clustering coefficient. Now, often when you look into a network as such, you do not have a clear understanding of the properties of the different nodes. But when you look into the specific aspects such as uh, in this case shown, shown in this case as degree, what it tells you is how many connections a particular gene, protein or node has uh, in your network. So, what we can say from the first example on the top is the degree of the node is 8 that means it is connected to 8 other proteins. On the second property is the path length. What it is showing in this case if you calculate is that the number of edges that you need to travel from one node to the other. So, if, you, if I ask you what is the path length between that first and the bottom node in this figure, you would say the path length is equal to 2. The third kind of property which often uh, studied is the clustering coefficient. Clustering coefficient tells how often the neighbors of a given node are connected to what you would see in a completely connected graph. Let us look, look at more detailed examples. For instance, if you are studying the degree of a node, in the case of an undirected network such as in the example shown in the top, the fluorescent node that is shown in a fluorescent color has a degree of equal to 2. On the other hand, a directed node example shown at the bottom has a degree equal to 4 because it is connected to 4 other nodes. However, what you can also say is there is an in degree and out degree and in degree is the number of incoming connections of a particular node. So, the green or fluorescent node here has an in degree of 1. It also has an out degree equal to 3 because it is uh, directing 3 other nodes shown in a red color out there. So, its out degree equals 3. Now, you can also extend this idea of undirected and directed uh, graphs and ask what is the path length of a node. Now, as I mentioned, the path length is referred to as the number of edges that one need to travel for between two different nodes that you are interested. On in the top uh, uh, network that you are seeing, the path length between the two green or fluorescent nodes is equal to 2 as well as equal to 1 because the path that you can take can be different than the shortest path that you are looking at. However, almost often unless otherwise specified, when you are talking about the path length between two nodes, it is the shortest path length. So, the two fluorescent nodes have a path length equals to 1. However, if you are, if you are asked what are all the path lengths, you would say there it has two different paths, one with a path length of 1, the other with a path length of 2. In the undirected networks, your definition of path length essentially does not change. So, in the examples, in the example that you see at the bottom, the path length between the two fluorescent nodes is equal to 2. The other property that I was referring to uh, previously is the clustering coefficient of a node and clustering coefficient refers to the number of connections between the neighbors of a given node of interest to what you would see in a completely connected graph. Now, let us look at an example. In, the, in, this, in this figure that you see, there is the, the first example, the, the fluorescent node, the green node has three connections, three red dots are connected to it. However, if you ask the number of connections between the red dots, it is 0. There are 0 connections between the red dots. But if they were fully connected, you would see that they will have 3 edges between them. So, the clustering coefficient of the fluorescent node right now is 0 upon 3. Let us look at the second toy network. In the second toy network, the fluorescent node has a clustering coefficient of 2 upon 3. In the third case, the clustering coefficient of the fluorescent node is 3 upon 3 which is completely connected. So, the clustering coefficient is equal to 1. Now, more generally 
the, the a, a formula can be uh, brought up and it, it can be written as if there are m number of interactions between the neighbors of a node of interest and there are n number of neighbors of a given node of interest then it can be written as m upon n into n minus 1 by 2. So, that would be defined as the clustering coefficient of that particular node and when average the clustering coefficient of a node on a whole network scale it gives you an essence of modularity of the network. The higher the average clustering coefficient the more likely is the network uh, cluster or can be decomposed into specific uh, modules. Another property that is of great interest in understanding biological networks is the scale free structure. And while a lot of biological networks are documented and shown to be scale free, transcriptional networks are also documented uh, to be scale free structures. So, what exactly are scale free networks? Scale free networks are correspond to the structure of a network where there are few nodes which are highly connected. For instance, in the figure to the left, in the network figure that you see to the left, there is a big red dot, big red node which is highly connected. So, but there are not many such highly connected nodes and there are many uh, nodes which are very poorly connected. So, in other words a scale free structure refers to uh, a network structure where there are few nodes which are highly connected and most nodes are poorly connected. Or more mathematically if you plot the connectivity of a node versus the number of nodes with a given connectivity you should see a power law distribution or otherwise if you plot the log log plot of the connectivity versus the number of nodes with a given connectivity you should see a negative slope of gamma as shown in this figure where gamma lies between 2 to 3 that is when you can call the structure to be scale free and the net uh, and the distribution to be a, a power law distribution. Now, what is so special about this scale free structure? Scale free structures have been postulated to provide robustness to the biological system. Now, what exactly is robustness? So, robustness is the ability of a complex system, a complex system such as a biological system to maintain its function even when the structure of the system changes significantly. Now, let us look at an example. So, in the network figure that you see, if you randomly put up any of these nodes, you are likely to affect a small fraction of the network. However, if you target the highly connected node that is the central node which is highly connected you are going to disrupt a major fraction of this network suggesting that these highly connected nodes can be vulnerable to, to be the drug target. So, if you are uh, trying to inhibit the growth of a pathogen you are likely to target these highly connected nodes because you are more likely to be able to crumble the biological system of the pathogen. So, and this has uh, been increasingly gaining attention as, as a method of targeting drugs to this kind of uh, this class of proteins. So, as mentioned earlier we have been talking about regulation of a single transcription factor, but in the context of networks regulation is much more complex and what we are referring to is a combinatorial uh, regulation by many different transcription factors. Let us look at a specific uh, scenario. So, the slide actually the slide shown here shows a typical regulatory system in a bacterial uh, gene bacterial organism. What you uh, usually have is a set of signals which are sensed by the cell and these uh, signals are sensed by sensor proteins. These sensor proteins could be transcription uh, transporters or this could also be histidine kinases and once these sensor proteins sense the signals from the exterior or even sometimes interior of the cell they can cascade the information to transcription factors. The transcription factors upon receiving these signals can change from active to inactive or inactive to active state. And when this happens because of multiple sensor proteins these transcription factors can uh, change the conformation and bind to the upstream regions. And shown at the bottom is a stretch of DNA where these transcription factors can bind in a combinatorial fashion often and control the expression of the target gene or operon. As a rule of thumb if transcription factors bind to the upstream regions uh, in the upstream of transcription start site shown as plus 1 that is where the transcription uh, actually starts you often are stimulating the polymerase and enhancing, enhancing the expression. However, when you bind to the downstream of transcription start site you typically repress the expression of the target gene thereby blocking the transcription by the polymerase shown in the oval shaped uh, polymerase uh, symbol in green. So, 
Based on these principles and together with the interplay with the transcription factors and the polymerase, your transcript is produced. And once transcript is produced, you can have mRNA and protein levels regulation which is not uh, what we will be talking immediately now. But all these levels together contribute to provide feedback and this is typically uh, a system, a simple regulatory system that you encounter in bacterial uh, organisms. But more complex systems, more complex eukary eukaryotic gene regulation is much more complex and beyond the scope of our current discussion. As discussed uh, in the previous slides, uh, the basic unit of regulation is a transcription factor and a target gene whose expression is being controlled. Now, on a different scale, if you increase or uh, if you put together all the set of regulatory events between transcription factors and the target genes or operons, you construct a global transcription regulatory network. And as I mentioned earlier, this network is a scale free structure, scale free network. But in addition to this, it is also hierarchical structure, wherein what we are actually referring to in a hierarchical structure is there are a set of transcription factors which are able to regulate a large number of genes and there are a set of genes uh, other transcription factors which are also controlled by this global transcription factors shown at the top of this uh, network structure. And both the top layer and the second layer all of them together regulate the set of genes which are not essentially encoding for the protein coding, uh, which are not essentially encoding for the transcription factors. So, in a way there are transcription factors which are at the top of the system, there are transcription factors which are controlled by this top layer and there are subsequent layers and the number of layers in such a hierarchical structure depends on the complexity of the system. Now, in between the top and the bottom layer, the in between the leftmost uh, fi uh, figure of the basic unit and the rightmost figure, there are set of substructures or subgraphs within the regulatory network which we call as motifs. Motifs are the set of subgraphs which occur more often than expected by chance. And there are three kinds of regulatory motifs that are identified in regulatory networks. One is the feed forward loop where there is there are two transcription factors. The first transcription factor regulates the other two genes. The second transcription factor regulates the target gene. The second kind of motif is multiple input module where there are two different transcription factors both of them regulate two different target genes. The third is a single input module where a single transcription factor regulates a set of target genes. Now, each of this set of uh, regulatory motifs have been shown to have specific functions and which would be beyond the scope of our current discussion. Now, Although the idea of regulation of uh, gene expression, the level of transcription has been documented for several years and the, we have extensive understanding, very little is known about the regulation of gene expression beyond transcription and it has only been recently being appreciated uh, uh, about the re role of re regulation at the post transcription level. Now, most of this evidence for the reason why post transcription regulation is becoming important is coming from the lack of correlation between mRNA and protein pools in modal systems. Now, uh, there is now enough evidence to suggest that this post transcription processes are actually controlled by a class of proteins called RNA binding proteins. Among non protein coding uh, components such as microRNAs, uh, non coding RNAs. So, RNA binding proteins are now known to be involved in controlling the RNA processing, RNA longevity as well as in the translation. Now, in particular as soon as a gene is transcribed uh, and pre mRNA is produced, splicing associated RNA binding proteins bind to the pre mRNA and convert into mature mRNA by splicing of the introns. Now, the produced RNA not necessarily only mRNA is needs to be exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm and this is carried out by class of RNA binding proteins which can be termed as transport RNA binding proteins shown with number 2 uh, in the figure. RNA binding proteins have also been implicated in the specific subcellular localization of these transcripts. Uh, RNA binding proteins are documented also in controlling the stability of the transcripts thereby promoting or degrading uh, the expression of these transcripts. Uh, as, as is expected RNA binding proteins a number of them are associated with the ribosomal uh, proteins uh, to control the regulation of expression at the translation level. 
Now, another aspect of regulation, understanding regulation at the post transcription level is that number of RNA binding proteins are involved in human diseases, major class of human diseases such as cancer, muscular atrophies and neurological disorders. Uh, in this network diagram shown here, the major class of uh, diseases are, are shown in orange while the subtypes of diseases uh, which are which are sub which can be sub classified are shown in blue and the specific rna binding proteins which have been documented or impl implicated in these disorders are shown uh, in or uh, in in green and now let's take it a specific example of uh, of a muscular atrophy called myotonic uh, dystrophy in this particular kind of disorder uh, a cug repeat binding protein called cugpp1 binds to the 3 prime untranslated region of a dm protein kinase and because of the sequestration of the cug repeat binding protein onto the trinucleotide repeat expansion in the 3 prime untranslated regions uh, per this particular uh, disease phenotype is observed uh, another example of a mis misregulation of an rna binding protein happens in opmd which is another kind of uh, muscular atrophy in this particular kind of disease uh, there is a gcg repeat expansion in the exon 1 of an rna binding protein uh, which is a poly a binding protein called pab pn1 another example we can observe which is which is heavily documented in the literature is a brain specific splicing factor called nova whose misexpression is known to cause a disease called poma which is a subtype of neurological diseases so what i'm trying to arrive at here is that if there is a change in expression of either rna binding protein or any of its targets it can be associated to a disease phenotype and all these studies basically suggest that it is not just the effect of a single gene or protein it's rather a combination of different set of genes and proteins which contributes to a disease phenotype now while this observation is not very new while we know that this is common for a number of complex diseases what we have still been not able to achieve is uh, they able to cure diseases for this complex diseases now let me introduce to you the traditional notion of how drug discovery uh, is uh, usually happening in most places let's uh, represent the healthy state of an individual uh, with a network of interactions shown uh, in this figure on to the left now a disease state could be uh, studied as a perturbation in such a network where some of these nodes uh, are actually not properly connected compared to the healthy state now according to the idea of paul elrich and others the magic bullet approach suggests that the conversion of disease state to the healthy state uh, should involve one or most likely one one particular drug which is non promiscuous and specific to a particular drug target so that you have minimal off target effects now often such magic bullet approach can only yield uh, a only a semi recovery to the uh, to the from the disease state now what network pharmacology or network medicine approaches are trying to arrive at is use a combination of perhaps promiscuous drugs but which do not cause uh, negative side effects uh, which do not cause side effects with are lethal and can still convert the disease state into healthy state as close as it is to the original one now how would you achieve such an approach to understand uh, the this particular idea let's look at a network representation of how the different entities in the cell are interacting in the figure to the right you can see that a number of drugs uh, each of them can be perturbing different nodes now all of these nodes are actually interconnected to each other because we are looking into the cellular context and there are protein protein interactions there are metabolic interactions there are also regulatory interactions perturbation of one cannot be seen in isolation it has to be seen in the context of other perturbations now a combination of these perturbations uh, is going to yield a phenotype which we hope can be uh, treating the complex disease the, that is the concept behind this uh, idea of network pharmacology now how do we achieve such a uh, bigger goal so usually when you have such kind of a uh, uh, complex problem complex phenotype you have to put together data such as uh, knowledge on the current metabolic network in the human genome knowledge on the transcription network knowledge on the protein protein interaction network and knowledge on the post transcription network and together with the current knowledge of the drugs and the targets and the target pathways one can start looking at how these perturbations can be studied in the context of specific diseases and what particular drugs can be used to identify potential new therapies for existing uh, diseases 
An alternative uh, set of approaches which are being used in the context of drug, dis drug discovery is that if you have a target, uh, a drug target network for all the uh, approved drugs in the literature, one can start understanding what are the drugs which are sharing the targets. Can we use the, uh, the drugs which share the targets as alternatives to existing uh, drugs? Why if there is a re re resistance acquired for a particular drug, can you complement the current drug with another drug which is having the same set of targets? Or one can start studying the set of drug drug uh, relations. If the drugs are sharing the targets, can we start studying what are the profiles of the two drugs which are linked? Are they similar in the structure? Are they similar in the final phenotypes? Or what are the common principles of these drugs which are uh, connected to each other? Likewise, one can also study disease-disease uh, associations by linking any pair of drugs which are working, which are used for the same uh, disease. Likewise, one can study target-target network to construct a disease-disease association network. So, this is uh, these are some of the ideas which where the field is moving to understand or to even repurpose existing drugs for novel therapies. So, to conclude what we have uh, tried to cover in the past set of uh, slides is that the network based approaches are essential and a powerful paradigm for dissecting the design principles of biological systems. They play an important role in biomarker identification and even in the elucidation of key players responsible for the disease phenotype. Uh, systems medicine can lead to the development of personalized medical treatment options in years to come with developments in high throughput sequencing and other technologies which can yield a lot of uh, data in a very short time so that clinical relevance can be achieved for based on these kind of uh, 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 techniques, application of these uh, network based approaches in the context of clinical settings. Thank you very much Sharath for uh, giving a very nice talk. and. Uh giving some of the basic concepts as well as illustrating how uh, systems level uh, network studies can be employed for addressing various type of problems including uh, in the drug discovery as well as in uh, pharmacology and it could be extended for even biomarker discovery and many other applications. So thank you very much. Now let's try to integrate the omics approaches with systems biology. So, genome sequencing projects in genomics era from 1990s to 2000 accelerated the pace of omics research. Then from 2000 onwards, proteomics field also got accelerated and new methodologies, new tools came into the place for studying the proteome and the data derived from genomics transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics and other omics approaches have now brought the integration of these data sets in the systems biology field. The system study requires obtaining data sets from different approaches and analyzing them. For example, as shown in the slide, the genome wide data sets can be derived at the genome level on looking at the expression of the different transcripts or at the proteome level looking at different type of protein interactions. These data sets can be stored in the clinical databases and also it can be mined from the literature, literature manual curation. Then integration of the orthogonal data sets further can be used for validating the networks and deriving identifying therapeutic targets. Further, it can be used for experimental validation. Studying systems cannot be done in isolation in individual labs. It requires different expertise and collaborations from scientists from different disciplines of biology, physics, engineering, chemistry, computer science, mathematics, medicine, statistics and many more. So, eventual aim of this goal of this current systems biology field is to employ the omics level information obtained from different levels from genome, transcriptome and proteome derive that information at the systems level, integrate quantitate some models and then propose and use it for the understanding the physiology and apply that in medicine. 
So, this omics to physiology this flow can be well maintained by employing systems biology tools. What are the challenges of systems biology? Systems biology is extremely challenging. The emphasis is to understand a system. Understanding dynamics of even simplest biological networks not only requires only the understanding of biology, but also its modeling and simulation. The disintegrative study can be used for studying from cells to proteins to gene or integrative study could be used for putting these pieces back together again and then understanding and doing the prediction and control of functional biological processes. So, all of these are very challenging, but currently being addressed by applying various systems level tools. So, how proteomics and system biology are integrated? Proteomics as we have studied, it is useful to understand the complex signaling networks in biological systems. It is very indispensable tool for system biology. The global analysis of proteome is important. However, there are many limitations. In each experiment, only thousands of proteins can be studied. Therefore, new approaches and systems level investigation and predictions are required. The system investigation is required to study the complex dynamic structure interaction with the biological systems, whether it is at cellular level or at the organism level and ultimately it is responsible for their function and behavior. So, in summary, Today we discussed that how omics era, the technological advancement in genomics, proteomics and metabolomics have generated large scale data sets in all the aspects of biology. These large data sets has motivated the computational biologists and systems approaches with objective of understanding the biological system as a whole. While Proteomics continues to generate the quality data at the proteome level. So, systems biology approach characterizes and predicts these dynamic properties of biological networks. Now, in the next module we will focus in more detail different type of proteomic technologies. Thank you.